Thank you. That concludes the questions. And we're moving on to the next item of business, which is portfolio questions on fin finance, economy and fair work. Can I say to members and remind them that questions two and three and questions seven and eight will be grouped together, which means I will take the two questions, the supplementaries pertaining to two, the supplementaries pertaining to three by the members. If you want a supplementary to two and three, you press then, but you'll be taken after two and three. I hope I've explained that. If not, I've muddled myself up in the process. Uh, question one, Jenny Goldruth, please. I beg your pardon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it is tackling unemployment in the Mid Fife and Glenrothes constituency. Minister Jamie Hepburn. Thank you, President Officer. The Scottish Government and its agencies are committed to tackling unemployment by supporting inclusive economic growth across Scotland, including in Mid Fife and Glenrothes. For example, in 2018 19, Scottish Enterprise committed investment of over £1 million in local enterprise companies through regional selective assistance and research and development awards. Jenny Gilruth. I thank the Minister for that answer. In 2017-18, Fife had an impressive 7% of the national total of modern apprenticeship starts, with more than 27,000 taking up the qualification. However, the most recent stats for the 2018-19 period point to a slight drop in female modern apprenticeship starts compared to the same period last year. Uh, can the Minister advise what practical work is being done by Skills Development Scotland in my constituency to close the gender gap in modern apprenticeships? Minister. Well, as uh, Ms Gilruth points out, Fife is doing very well in, in terms of the number of modern apprenticeships overall. In 2017-18, uh, the last full year we have figures for there were 1,893 uh, modern apprentices uh, in Fife. And I think we should place on record our thanks to employers across the kingdom for offering those opportunities. But I do recognise more has to be done to diversify, diversify participation, uh, improving female participation. Work uh, is underway in Fife and across the country. Uh, Skills Development Scotland has its apprenticeship Quality Action Plan. There is also the STEM strategy to try and tackle gender segregation and subject choice at school, as uh, emphasised in our Gender Pay Gap Action Plan as well. So there's activity in training, but I absolutely recognise much more remains to be done. James Kelly. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. One of the ways to tackle uh, unemployment in Mid Fife and other communities in Scotland is to lift people out of poverty. So can I ask the Minister if the Government will take urgent action to investigate the £22 million of funds that the, the, the EU has suspended in terms of ESF funding to tackle poverty and take immediate action to release that money into Scotland's communities. Minister. Well, I think the, the first thing I should say is, yes, we're aware of the issue and we are actively exploring it, so I can give Mr Kelly that assurance. But a number of the projects that are funded through that source, are continuing to be supported. So I think we should also place that on record, but we are aware of the issue, and I can assure Mr Kelly and the rest of the Chamber that is something we are actively exploring a resolution to. Question two, Neil Bibby. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to promote inclusive growth in the North Ayrshire economy. Minister Ive McKee. The Scottish Government is committed to achieving inclusive growth in all parts of Scotland, including North Ayrshire. Inclusive growth is assisted by a significant investment in housing, education and skills, transport, health and other areas. Specifically, the North Ayrshire economy will benefit from the £103 million committed by the Scottish Government for the Ayrshire Growth Deal. The Heads of Terms Agreement signed in March includes significant local investment proposals, including the Great Harbour, the I3 project and marine tourism in North Ayrshire, as well as regional initiatives for skills, digital and community wealth building. Neil Bibby. It's now over six months since the Fraser of Allender published their economic review for North Ayrshire Council. The review highlighted the importance of inclusive growth in tackling regional inequalities. It also states that if significant inroads are to be made in tackling regional challenges, this will require major investment and national strategic support. Given that the spending power of North Ayrshire Council has been diminished through Scottish Government cuts and that North Ayrshire was passed over as a location for the new Social Security Agency, despite being identified as the Question, best option please. for inclusive growth, what will the Scottish Government now do to turn its rhetoric into reality about inclusive growth in North Ayrshire? Minister. 
Uh, as members should be aware, Scottish Enterprises approved, approved a funding offer of £10 million towards Peelport's £30 million proposed project to redevelop its Hunterson Park site in North Ayrshire. And North Ayrshire has been allocated £1.4 million from the Town Centre Regeneration Fund for 2019-20. And North Ayrshire projects have received more than £2 million through empowering communities programme funds to date. Uh, Scottish Enterprise also continues to deliver support to businesses in North Ayrshire, the Innovation Grants, the Scottish Manufacturing Advice Service, Regional Selective Assistance and Research and Development Grants. Question three, Jamie Green. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to bring job opportunities to North Ayrshire. Minister. The Scottish Government and its agencies are committed to achieving inclusive growth in all parts of Scotland, including North Ayrshire, and we are working with a range of partners to create high-quality jobs and opportunities in the area. Specifically, North Ayrshire will benefit from the £103 million committed by the Scottish Government for the Ayrshire Growth Deal. The Heads of Terms agreement signed in March includes significant investment proposals from the Scottish Government for projects in North Ayrshire, and the Ayrshire Regional Partners estimate the deal will result in 7,000 new jobs across the region. Jamie Green. Uh, I'm pleased the Minister welcomes this uh, multi-government investment uh, in North Ayrshire, but the reality is that the Scottish Government's regional employment study highlighted that underemployment in North Ayrshire has risen to 13.5%, whereas in other local authorities it is falling. So can I ask the Minister what action the Government is taking specifically to address the issue of underemployment in Scotland? Minister. Uh, the, North, uh, the, 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 the North Ayrshire Inclusive Growth Diagnostic was a, a joint piece of work between the Office of the Economic Advisor and North Ayrshire Council, which is looking at exactly what the issues are round about barriers to growth in the area, a significant one of which, as the member has identified, is round about uh, un underemployment. Um, and that has been rolled forward through North Ayrshire Council's Fair for All strategy to tackle inequalities in the area and influence investment decisions to deliver long-term transformational change in the North Ayrshire economy. Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Minister will be aware that if delivered, the proposed economic master plan at Hunterson will bring over 1,700 jobs to North Ayrshire, supported by local Labour and Tory councils, as well as, my, as well as myself and the MP. Does he agree it's time Mr Green came off the fence on this issue and stopped trying to be all things to everyone? And through the Ayrshire growth deal and directly, what support will the Scottish Government provide to successfully deliver this master plan? Minister. Uh, as a member will be aware, and uh, others are aware, the uh, Scottish Government has committed £103 million to the Ayrshire growth deal over the next 10 years. We and our agencies are committed to working with all partners to help secure the future of the Hunterson site and to maximise its inclusive growth opportunities. Uh, and yes, I would encourage all local politicians to work in common purpose on this. And as for direct support, as I mentioned earlier, in November last year, Scottish Enterprise committed £10 million towards this uh, redevelopment. This investment in joint working between Scottish Enterprise, North Ayrshire Council and private sector partners has the potential to deliver significant benefits to North Ayrshire and the wider Ayrshire economy. Question four, Alistair Allen. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it has made in assisting the workforce of the Talk Talk call centre in Stornoway. Minister Jamie Hebburn. The Scottish Government, Highlands and Islands Enterprise and Pace Partners are continuing their contact with Talk Talk and those staff facing redundancy to ensure all employment opportunities are explored and pay support provided. Uh, sorry, Alistair Allen. Uh, I thank the Minister for that answer. Talk Talk um, has of course been a significant employer in Lewis and the loss of these jobs will have an impact on the broader economy. Will the Scottish Government commit to examining whether there are any opportunities for further public sector jobs to be based in the islands? Minister. Well, let me say, President Officer, I very much recognise the key role that public sector jobs play in the economy of, of all parts of Scotland and, of course, in the islands. The, the Scottish Government is currently consulting on the development of the National Islands Plan, which will set a, a number of objectives to support and promote our island communities, including employment, but where there are opportunities to be taken that make sense and we will always be willing to look at what can be done. Rhoda Grant. Um, I agree that public sector jobs should be dispersed throughout um, Scotland rather than centralised, but would you also consider with regard to Talk Talk uh, a staff buyout of the organisation and help to allow them to bid for work on, co on a call centre basis so that those jobs could be retained in Stornoway? Minister. No such proposition has been advanced thus far, but as she knows from uh, my exchanges previously, this government has uh, high ambitions for employee-owned businesses, and if it's something that the workforce there are interested in, then I would be very delighted to engage with them directly on that. 
Question five, Tavish Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the implications are for its public sector pay policy of the agreement reached with the teaching profession. Minister Kate Forbes. Well, the public policy uh, pay um, sets a framework for pay negotiations uh, and balances, delivering a fair deal for employees with affordability and investment in high quality public services. But it acts as a benchmark against which employers have flexibility to deliver pay awards meeting their local circumstances. And the Teachers' Pay Award includes an element targeted at addressing recruitment and retention issues, including a wider package of measures to address workload issues and support the Empowering Schools agenda. Tavi Scott. Thank you, and I'm grateful to the Minister for that reply. She will be aware that uh, exactly the same circumstances apply to Highlands Islands Airports Limited with regard to the ATC strike that is uh, pending, uh, suspended for next Wednesday, but uh, still threatened for the uh, future. Would she bring the same flexibility to those pay negotiations and also recognise that, of course, ministers directly intervened in the teacher strike? We could do with some inter intervention on the ATC strike as well, because Lifeline Air Services depend on them. Minister. Well, like the member, I recognise that it's been a very difficult time for, uh, for travellers with the disruption and I welcome the suspension of industrial action scheduled for 12th June and would encourage HIAL's air traffic controllers to carefully consider that latest offer made by HIAL for a new retention allowance. But when, in light of my earlier uh, answer, I do reiterate that that pay policy is a guide and a benchmark. And in that sense, it is up to um, negotiation uh, between employers and employees in terms of delivering a pay package. Murdo Fraser. Uh, thank you. Does the Scottish Government still have a public sector pay policy that's worth the paper it's printed on? Because it doesn't sound like it from the latest deals that have been struck. Minister. We do indeed have a pay policy that ensures it's affordable um, and invests in uh, high quality public services. But as I've already said, that acts as a benchmark against which employers have flexibility to deliver pay awards meeting their local circumstances. And we reflect on the impact of all sectoral awards in developing pay policies and we'll do so again um, in time for next year's pay policy in the context of the spending review. Neil Finlay. Uh, I commend the EIS for securing a deal for its members, but uh, when the uh, Scottish Government gave some prison officers uh, an upgrade in their pay but left others floundering, they were taken to court by the PCS union and caved in. In the same vein, the Government is treating some council workers uh, in one way and other council workers in another way. Um, what has happened to the pay policy and what has happened to fairness? Yeah, for a moment, I thought we were drifting off teaching, but it is about public pay policy, please. And again, I would reiterate the point that the pay policy does not directly apply across all workforces. It acts as a benchmark for pay awards in other sectors, and it sets the tone for the wider public sector, which will help increase labour participation and productivity, so that work pays both for the individual and for the Scottish economy. And key sectors, local government, health, police, firefighters, have all delivered arrangements broadly in line with our public sector pay policy. Uh, question 7 and 8 have been grouped together, so I take question 7, Claire Adamson. Thank you very much. Presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government how many accredited real living wage employers there are in Scotland. Minister Jamie Hepburn. Scotland has 1,473 living wage accredited employers, proportionately over five times more than the rest of the UK. Claire Adamson. Thank the Minister for the answer. According to Living Wage Scotland, over 3,000 workers across Lanarkshire have received a pay increase to the real living wage of £9 per hour. But low pay is still one of the main drivers of in-work poverty. What action is the Scottish Government taking to encourage more employers, like myself, to pay the real living wage in Motherwell and Wisha and across Scotland? Minister. It, well, uh, the figures I've indicated in terms of accreditation, I hope are viewed as being positive. But there is, of course, much more uh, to be done through uh, the work that we undertake with the Poverty Alliance. We uh, aim over the course of this parliamentary term to uh, see an uplift of 25,000 workers, more workers across Scotland being paid at least the uh, real living wage uh, or more through accreditation. But of course, we're also taking forward our Fair Work First agenda so that uh, all job related grants paid by our agencies will uh, ensure that the living wage is paid. We're undertaking activity in the social care and early years and learning childcare settings to make sure that the workforce there is paid the living wage. But I thought 
uh, that uh, the member thought Claire Anderson made a, a salient point when she referred to the fact that she uh, is a living wage employer. It shows that we can show leadership as well. And in our communities, we should be encouraging all employers in their area to become accredited and pay at least the real living wage. Question eight, Neil Finlay. To ask the Scottish Government how many people in Scotland earn less than living wage. Minister. Uh, the living wage initiative is an important part of the Scottish Government's fair work agenda. In 2018, there were 470,000 workers earning less than the real living wage in Scotland. Since 2015, the number of workers in Scotland earning the real living wage or more has increased. This means in total, 80.6% of all workers in Scotland now receive the real living wage, the highest proportion of all the UK countries. Neil Finlay. Yeah. In West Lothian, 16,000 were rece uh, receiving a pay under the living wage in 2012. It's now 17,500. Um, we could impact on that if there was the political will to do that. So why, in a very straightforward question, doesn't the government insist that in its public procurement policy that contractors pay the living wage and that any companies that receive government direct assistance also pay the living wage? Minister. Well, I've made the point about the Fair Work First uh, agenda that we are taking forward that I think will see improvements in terms of uh, procurement, of course, the procurement reform. Uh, Scotland Act took uh, every opportunity to address the, the real living wage through procurement. It requires our public body's procurement strategies to include a statement on the general policy of payment of the living wage. To people involved in delivering contracts in October 2015, we published statutory guidance addressing fair work practices, including the living wage and procurement, which public bodies should be following. Uh, I can say right now the Scottish Government has gone through a, a recent trawl uh, which shows that 96% of all suppliers who were awarded onto a Scottish Government collaborative agreement during the period of January 2017 to March 2018 made a commitment to pay the real living wage. I think that is significant progress, it is encouraging, but we continue to strive towards 100%. Thank you. That concludes questions on finance, economy and fair work. We now move on to questions on environment, climate change and land reform. Question one, Bruce Crawford. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the action that it is taking to reduce single-use plastic usage. Presiding Officer, I think we're now... <laughs> you do that down. very slowly, I think, to allow the Minister to get to, to please. Uh, are you ready, Minister? You are. Minister Mary Gujol. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We are absolutely committed to tackling Scotland's throwaway culture and to matching the pace which was envisaged by the EU Single Use Plastics Directive. We're already taking very ambitious action and we're the first country in, in the UK to announce our design for Scotland's deposit return scheme. We've taken action on plastic cotton buds and microbeads and our expert panel is considering measures to reduce the use of difficult to recycle items such as single use beverage cups. And we've committed to increasing the single use carrier bag charge to 10 pence and are part of a UK wide consultation on the form of packaging producer responsibility arrangements. And you can speed up your delivery now, if you like, Mr Crawford. I was actually trying to make room for the cabinet secretary. I didn't realise the minister, so forgive me, Price Agnova, sir. Is the Minister aware that the recent report by the Centre for International Law found that the proliferation of single-use plastic around the world is accelerating global greenhouse gas emissions and climate change? The Committee on Climate Change was clear on the need for action in order for Scotland to reach its net zero ambitions, given the importance of reserved UK policy levers. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline any specific areas she thinks require action from the UK Government? You've been promoted, Minister. Minister. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we, we very much welcome that report and we've already taken steps to address the recommendations on single-use plastics. On the CCC advice and the need for UK government action in reserved areas, the Cabinet Secretary has written twice to the UK Minister of State, Claire Perry, to request an urgent meeting to discuss action to accelerate the deployment of fully operational carbon capture and storage facilities, accelerate the decarbonisation of the gas grid, redesign vehicle and tax incentives, commit to adhering to future EU emission standards, reducing VAT on energy efficiency improvement in homes and ensuring continued support for the renewables industry. Now, these are areas are reserved and it's imperative that if we're to meet our ambitious targets, we need the UK government to take action and to address these. And there's also a whole host of other areas where action could be taken, but where a contrary approach has been adopted, which has disincentivised re renewable uh, technologies, for example. Claudia Beamish, followed by Gail Ross. 
Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Plastic pollution is indeed a systemic problem which causes systemic uh, uh, danger and, and, and damage to our environment. Uh, will the government commit to a system-wide arrangement for measures to tackle this issue? For example, uh, a range of targets for the different types of, of um, plastic to reduce them and also to ban those that can't be recycled. Minister. I thank Claudia Beamish for that question because we are doing a whole pile of work when it comes to single-use plastics, whether that's on land first in terms of reduced reuse and recycling, but also when they end up in our marine environment as well. So I'd be happy to, or the Cabinet Secretary, Cabinet Secretary would be happy to have a further conversation uh, with Claudia Beamish about what she's proposing. Gail Ross. The presiding officer, does the minister agree that education is one of our strongest tools in tackling single-use plastic and groups like the Ullipul Sea Savers are great examples which could be re replicated across the country? Here, here. Minister. <laughs> Probably won't surprise Gail Ross, but I absolutely uh, agree with her because I think that the Ullapool Sea Savers in particular have really led the way on these issues. And I think we'll all be aware right across the chamber when we visit primary school ourselves uh, that, to be honest, whenever I visit primary schools in my own constituency, the one issue that they raise with me every single time is about marine litter, it's about plastics and what we are doing. And I think it's only right that they consider that they continue to, to push us to strive to do more. And I think we should be proud of the young people that we have in this country and the fact that they take such an interest in this and we are listening and we are doing what we can. Question two, Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it will assist people in remote and rural areas in dealing with the climate emergency. Cabinet Secretary. Delivering the transformative change required to tackle the global climate emergency must be a shared national endeavour. The Scottish Government is now looking across our whole range of responsibilities to make sure we continue with the policies that are working and increase action where necessary. Over the summer, the Scottish Government will engage the public communities, businesses, industry and the public sector, including in remote and rural areas, in a discussion about what more can be done and how we can work together. Julian Martin. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Many of the measures outlined that will reduce an area's carbon emissions require transformative action at local authority level. How will the particular challenge of decarbonising uh, transport in areas such as mine in Aberdeenshire, which is one of the highest mileage of roads, and a high proportion of off-gas and hard-to-heat homes be given tailored assistance? And how will the administration's decisions be held to account in our national endeavour to deal with the climate emergency? Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government support the Energy Saving Trust, uh, which provides bespoke advice to homeowners and insulation and energy shortage, uh, storage, which is particularly useful to off-grid and hard-to-heat homes. We've provided almost £10 million to local authorities across Scotland to ensure EV charge points are installed across the country, encouraging local authorities to focus on solutions for remote and rural communities. And the Scottish Government will keep exploring using hydrogen as a zero-carbon substitute fuel. Uh, fuel. Um, as the member probably is aware, Aberdeen has been a leader in this with 10 hydrogen buses already running on two routes in Aberdeen, with a further 10 coming into service later this year. Scotland is the only country to have statutory annual climate targets, ensuring that progress is regularly scrutinised in Parliament, uh, and there will be annual uh, reporting on a sector-by-sector -by -sector basis on progress to delivering the climate change plan. But I need to say, uh, again, what I've said before, the Scottish Government cannot do this on its own. It will involve a, a, a widespread endeavour, uh, including with local authorities, who, who will be expected to step up uh, to this and in that regard I welcome uh, the announcements by both Glasgow and Edinburgh Council in respect of their own uh, climate targets. John Scott followed by Rhoda Grant. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. With the deposit return scheme now being rolled out as part of the response to the climate emergency and rural shopkeepers starting to think about the likely cost to them, can the Cabinet Secretary tell Parliament what the expected installed cost of a plastic recycling machine will be to each rural shopkeeper and will the government be helping to defray this cost? Cabinet well, I, I think as the member is probably aware, um, what we are doing right now uh, is involving uh, um, organisations that represent shopkeepers, the length and breadth of the country, including the very small ones. We've indicated that there will be a variety of different options available uh, uh, for return um, and that may include uh, uh, the return vending machines, but it may not. Um, and that is a conversation that will be had 
uh, with, uh, with the organisations. Uh, I should also point out that there will be a handling fee. Um, what is expected is that this will, in the end, be cost neutral for all shopkeepers involved. Rhoda Grant. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what can be done to support people in less conventional housing tenures in rural areas such as agricultural holdings or tied cottages to allow them to increase energy efficiency, reduce household emissions and tackle fuel poverty? Cabinet Secretary. Well, there are a, a lot of things that I, uh, um, in play. I, I know the member will be aware of the widespread work that this government is doing on uh, energy efficiency. Um, and, uh, and that will continue. Um, the tenures of homes can sometimes create an issue. I'm aware of that. Um, it isn't the only issue, of course. Uh, um, sometimes uh, um, uh, there, are, there are other concerns. And when, when we talk about very unusual scenarios, I think that these are probably some of the harder ones to, to look at. If the member has got very specific examples in mind that she is asking this question about, it would be helpful if she could uh, um, come to me uh, and we can discuss them in more detail. Um, because I am aware that different tenures, particularly when it's tied housing, uh, can create some real barriers for people. Question three, Annabel Ewing. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to Five Council's call for an independent inquiry into the Musmorin petrochemical plant. Cabinet Secretary. We are aware of the motion that was passed by Five Council on the 2nd of May. We have not received any formal requests from Five Council regarding Musmorin since then. The Musmorin complex is subject to regulation by SEPA as an independent environmental regulator. On 25th April, SEPA announced a formal investigation at the site and calling for a further inquiry at this time could prejudice any potential enforcement action that SEPA may take. Annabel Hughes. Uh, switch off recording, please. Switch off recording. I forgot where I was now. Where was I? Was I calling you, Miss Ewing? Yes, you were. <coughs> it's a senior moment from me there. Miss Ewing, Annabel Ewing, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. And it is perhaps a wee bit disappointing to know that Five Council has not yet managed to forward to the Scottish Government their motion, which called on the Scottish Government to actually uh, commit to uh, an independent inquiry. But I'm sure that the Cabinet Secretary would be aware that one of the strands of Five Council's motion and an issue in, indeed which constituents raise with me is the need to have empirical data as regards health impacts. Can the Cabinet Secretary clarify whether there is any work uh, ongoing with regard to that matter? Cabinet Secretary. Um, thank you. Um, I, I have actually seen the motion, although I, I, there has been no formal approach from Five Council. I understand SEPA is sharing information with NHS Five where possible, whilst carrying out their ongoing regulatory investigation. Once NHS Five have assessed that data, uh, that data, an attempt will be made to address the most common health concerns in the local community in the most appropriate way. NHS Fife has not been contacted by any local GPs specifically regarding the Mossmorin complex. However, they're reviewing published health data with a view to engaging with local representatives and making information accessible for communities. Mark Ruskell to be followed by Alexander Stewart. At a recent public meeting in Loch Gelly, we heard powerful testimonies from hundreds of local residents, including families coping with autism, whose lives have been made a misery by the noise, light, and vibration from the plant. Is the Cabinet Secretary aware of any equalities impact assessments that have been carried out by SEPA in relation to the operation of this plant? And how will the government support these families? 
Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'm, I don't have detail about the uh, specific meeting that the member is uh, referring to, and he has raised some very specific issues there, which uh, um, obviously have some health impacts. I don't know that it uh, uh, would have been within uh, SEPA's purview to have looked at the kinds of impacts that, that the member is talking about, but I will go back and ask whether or not that is part and parcel, for example, of some of the work that NHS Fife might be uh, considering in this um, uh, and uh, uh, I will in, uh, ensure that he is um, he is kept uh, aware of that I mean obviously there is ongoing work being done by SEPA uh, they are monitoring they are looking at the situation within the regulatory setup which they're required to consider and we will estimate whether or not there is other things that need to be done by other public bodies at some other um, perhaps once that is done Alexander Stewart briefly please Thank you, Presiding Officer. Given the recent difficulties at the plant uh, regarding environmental health and social impacts, can the Cabinet Secretary indicate what further assistance can be given to ensure that local residents have confidence and trust in the operation of the site? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as I indicated, um, SEPA are continuing to provide updates on their dedicated Mosmoran hub and ongoing monitoring will be used to inform their investigation. In fact, air quality monitoring information so far continues, continues to show no sign, uh, no cause for concern. Um, however, other uh, uh, activities are being taken forward. Following previous enforcement action, both operators have submitted assessments of the best available techniques for carrying out their activities to SEPA, which are currently being reviewed. And I know that on 23rd of May, SEPA uh, served further permit variations. Um, uh, th there, there is ongoing work constantly uh, and as I indicated in my earlier response to Annabel Ewing, NHS Fife is now also uh, looking at the specific aspects which are more uh, properly for them to consider. Um, that information will all be brought together at an appropriate moment. Question four, Ali Rowley. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of the climate emergency, what action is it taking to act on the recommendations of the Committee on Climate Change to deliver low carbon infrastructure and homes? Secretary. The Scottish Government has acted immediately in response to the Committee's advice with amendments to our Climate Change Bill to set a net zero emissions target for 2045 and to increase the targets for 2030 and 2040. We are now looking across our whole range of responsibilities, including infrastructure and homes, to make sure we continue with the policies that are working and increase action where necessary. Our high ambition will be matched by on-the-ground delivery uh, and we, of course, will be updating the climate change plan within six months of the bill receiving royal assent. Alec Rowley. Presiding officer, there are tens of thousands of houses across Scotland that are being described as too expensive to insulate. Uh, if not the fuel poverty bill, if not the climate bill, when will the cabinet secretary actually legislate for addressing the state of Scotland's existing homes? the poor state of which is one of the key drivers of both fuel poverty and climate change. Would the Cabinet Secretary not agree that it's a win-win for both and the sooner that we get these houses insulated, the better? Cabinet Secretary. Well, there is an enormous work being done by this government in terms of energy efficiency. A huge amount of uh, uh, finance uh, that uh, will over a billion pounds, I think, by the time we get to 2021, work which is ongoing. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that is uh, very much part of uh, um, uh, the, the answer to, to what the, the members say. There are some very significant issues when it comes to uh, uh, retrofitting housing, and I think the member is probably well aware uh, of that. Uh, but we have an energy efficient Scotland route map, which was published last year, to make all our buildings warmer, greener and more efficient. And that will ensure that homes meet EPC band C by 2040. And we're already consulting on the impact of bringing forward that date, if possible. And we're also currently consulting on how to decarbonise the heat supply in buildings off the gas grid. There's a review of energy standards within building regulations underway to consider further opportunities to reduce emissions from new homes uh, and, and continuing wing, uh, work being done for energy efficiency. If the member is actually asking when I will bring in housing legislation, I'm sure he is absolutely aware that it would not be uh, for my portfolio to do any such thing uh, and I will make sure uh, that his request is relayed to the housing minister. If I have brief questions and brief answers, I can get the last three members in. Gil Patterson, please. Officer, 
To ask the Scottish Government what impact it believes the proposed deposit return scheme will have in tackling climate change. Cabinet Secretary. There is a global climate emergency and the Scottish Government is acting accordingly. Our first step, of course, has been to immediately lodge amendments to the Climate Change Bill targets in line with the independent expert advice of the Committee on Climate Change. Through enabling more higher value recycling, Scotland's deposit return scheme will contribute to these efforts by reducing emissions by around 4 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent over 25 years. That's an average of 160 tonnes each, 160,000 tonnes each year, the equivalent of taking 85,000 cars off the road. Gil Patterson. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to confirm that groups like St Eunan's Primary School in Clyde Bank, whose students are on a mission to reduce plastic use in all primary schools throughout Western Bartonshire, uh, will they have an opportunity to become involved in the deposit return scheme themselves? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the pupils of St Eunan's for their efforts in this important area and indeed to echo the comments made by uh, um, Marie Goujon earlier about all primary school children at the moment who are very exercised on issues related to this. We recognise the potentially significant role that schools and other community services can play in making DRS a success and that's why we intend to allow for these facilities to act as voluntary return points for containers captured through the scheme. I would also encourage all school pupils to consider how this could benefit their schools through encouraging donation of deposits to their schools, for instance, or litter picking to claim deposits. Question six, Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to improve air quality in densely populated urban areas such as Coatbridge. Minister Marigujo. The Scottish Government's Cleaner Air for Scotland strategy sets out a series of actions for Government, Transport Scotland, local authorities and others to further reduce air pollution right across Scotland. An independent review of that strategy is currently underway and that will identify priorities for any additional action. The Scottish Government works closely with North Lanarkshire Council to provide practical and financial assistance to monitor air quality, support the delivery of measures and implement their air quality action plan to improve local air quality. Fulton McGregor. Thank you, Minister, uh, for that response, and it's great to hear the assistance that's been made to, to make my constituency and wider area a cleaner and healthier place to live and grow up. She'll be aware of a very controversial and long-running proposal to build an incinerator between Caron Row and Shawhead next to the busy M8 A8 in Cope Bridge. Do not expect her to comment on this particular application, which is subject to appeal. However, she may be aware that this particular area no, is one I need of the most question. polluted areas in the country and number one in North Lanarkshire. and ask if the government has any data of the impact of incinerators on air quality in areas where pollution is already known to be high. Thank you. Minister. The responsibility for air quality monitoring and data lies with individual local authorities, but I'm not aware of any local authority uh, having identified any significant impact from incinerators on local air quality as a result of that work. But I would say just in terms of general air quality in North Lanarkshire, I just want to add that the latest data that we have shows that air quality in North Lanarkshire continues to improve year on year in most locations. There are a few hotspots of poorer air quality that still remain, uh, as uh, there are in many other Scottish towns and cities, but we're absolutely determined to tackle these remaining hotspots and to do that as soon as we possibly can. And North Lanarkshire Council has produced an air quality action plan covering the authority's three traffic-related air quality management areas. That plan contains a comprehensive range of measures and the Council is working closely with Scottish Government, Transport Scotland, SEPA and other partners on its implementation. Question 8, Adam Tompkins. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on Glasgow's progress in meeting the policy outcomes in its climate change plan. In meeting the policy outcomes in Scotland's climate change plan is monitored nationally. The Scottish Government acknowledges the ambitious approach Glasgow has taken to establishing its low emission zone and the recent announcement by Scottish Power in support of the city's ambition to become the first in the UK to achieve net zero emissions. And these are positive steps for the whole of Scotland. Adam Tompkin. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The Climate Change Plan states, and I quote, that the Scottish Government's ambition is to reduce emissions from transport in ways that promote sustainable environmental and socio-economic well-being, unquote. How will active travel contribute to realising this ambition? And how in particular will the Cabinet Secretary ensure that active travel is available not only in the less deprived areas of cities such as Glasgow, but also in the more deprived areas? Cabinet Secretary. It is fundamental to what uh, uh, um, my colleague Michael Matheson is promoting with active travel and indeed the whole of the government is promoting 
Um, the active travel budget was, uh, was doubled uh, um, fairly recently, so there's a great deal of money going into that, and we are very cognizant uh, of the need to consider active travel, not just in terms of recreation, but also in terms of actual access um, for local people, particularly in the circumstances um, that, he is, uh, um, that he is raising. As it happens, I will be uh, meeting with Glasgow Council next week to discuss their proposals for being a net zero city by, uh, uh, by 2030, and I will uh, undertake to specifically raise the active tra uh, travel with them when I do. Patrick Harvey, briefly. Thank you. Point one on Glasgow City Council's climate emergency working group terms of reference emphasises renewable heat. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that over the next few years we need to be taking very large numbers of residential and non-residential properties off the gas grid and giving them access to heat networks and that this will only happen with a much more ambitious approach uh, from the Scottish Government as well as local government? Cabinet Secretary. Well, indeed, um, uh, that is required, but uh, I, I notice that Patrick Harvey misses out the other government which is going to be necessary to achieving this, and that's the Westminster government, because without decarbonisation of the gas grid, then the uh, logistical issues of doing uh, what is required to do in terms of domestic heating in Scotland are very considerable indeed, and I hope you will join with me in calling on the Westminster government to get a move on uh, and do for their part what is required for them to do if we are, all of us in the UK, going to achieve our climate change ambitions. Thank you. That concludes portfolio questions. We have a short pause before we move on to the next item of business.